Hi, it's Tuesday, September the 20th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Today it's Romans 3, verses 9 to 20, and as we get into the letter here, Paul is in the middle of of confronting the attitude that the Jews are chosen and therefore less liable for sin than the Gentiles, or, or the Greeks, as, as, as he'll refer to them here. So what you need to appreciate is that this church in Rome, so we're going to call the people in that in this church Christian, it's not a word we're using yet, but the Jesus followers, many of them uh, have been raised Jewish. They're traditionally Jews who have, who have like many others, have, have, have uh, recognized in Jesus um, uh, a deeper faith. And so they are Jesus followers, but they're still Jewish uh, at this point. The, then there are those who have been drawn to the church and, be, and become part of this this movement who are Jesus followers, but they weren't raised as as um, as Jews. So the Jews have a sense, the Jewish Christians have a sense that as the law was given to them, there's a preferential option for them. They're in better shape, in a better relationship with God than the Gentile Christians, or or in this situation we'll call them Greeks. That's what what Paul's talking about. So Paul talks about Jews and Greeks. So he's talking about those raised in the faith and those who have come to it, um, but therefore are not traditionally not sons of Abraham, um, not descendants. Um, so, so that's what we've been doing is sort of you know fighting that attitude um, that, uh, and I quoted it yeah, yesterday that this idea that that. Um, God uh, will will convict uh, the Gentiles for their sin, and God will forgive the Jews for theirs. And Paul's going like, no, that's not it. The, 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 it's not whether you can claim the law, whether you know the law, it's whether you live the law. Um, God may have given the law to Moses, God has given it to, to Israel, to, to the Jews, um, but we're meant to live it, not just simply claim it. And there are Gentiles who do live it. Um, even sometimes not even knowing why, but they do. They sometimes, they live it as well or sometimes better than many Jews. So, <laughs> so there is no intrinsic value here in being Jewish. Uh, you're not automatically by birth in a better relationship with God. And that's pretty much where we pick it up. So here we go. Romans 3, 9 to 20. What then? Are we any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. Their throats are open graves, and they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified by his sight. That's the quote by deeds prescribed by the law for though the law for through the law comes the knowledge of sin okay <laughs> let's sit with that for a moment understandably paul has said to these to 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 uh to these jewish christians um no advantage jewish gentile Followers of Jesus doesn't make any difference. When they what are, are are we better off? They say, you know, um, and, and and Paul says no. No, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin. Are you not listening to me? He's saying, are you not listening to me? And then and then he goes into a a series of quotes. Right, it's actually I think fairly clever what he does here. Um, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. No one who seeks understanding. There's no one who seeks God. They've turned aside. Together they've become worthless. There's no one who shows kindness. There's not even one. Their throats are open graves. They use their tongues to deceive. I know you just heard me read this. The venom of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths. And the way of peace they have not known. 
Another quote, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, I know you heard that. I wanted to say it all again, but the thing that we don't realize it sometimes when we're saying it, Paul is essentially quoting Psalms. These are individual lines from a whole bunch of different Psalms. And at the end there, I think that's Isaiah. I'm going to say 58, maybe 59. Anyway, it's the thing is, Paul has taken a whole bunch of Hebrew scripture and quoted from it. Well, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There's no one who has understanding. There's no one who seeks God. These words were not written about the Gentiles or the Greeks specifically here. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. These words were written about the Jews uh, and or about everybody. There's been this sense of we're these good people and all those people out there are bad. And Paul's saying, no, no. It, it, we're all in this together, each and every one of us. So <laughs> those words in our scripture, that those words are for us. We can't sort of sit back, oh, no, that's not us. No, but it is, Paul says. It is. So are we better off? No, we're not better off. But we do know what the word says. We do know what the law says. Like We know. You're right. God gave it to us. We know. We know this. So, I mean, if we're if anything's better for us, it's like we know there's a problem. I guess that works. We know there's a problem so that we can work on it. Um, you know, as, as, as those who have inherited this covenant uh, with God as the chosen people, as it were, we are aware that things aren't right. So we have, we have the uh, invitation to work on it. There are those who are ignorant and have no idea. They think everything's fine. We know there is work to be done. We know that there is a better relationship with God to be had. I think Paul would say that. Um, but the thing is, you know, the thing with, 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 with the law is it makes us aware of our sin. It doesn't remedy it. Right? It's the actions that will be the remedy, which is the point, point Paul was making before. When he said, yeah, no, there are there are Greeks who, who do some really good things. Um, even though they can't claim the law, they're doing it. And better better to be following the law, even without knowing it, than to simply know it and not follow it. Um, so, so knowing the law, embracing the law, knowing how to recite it, all of that is wonderful because it points out to you, it reminds you that we are all in sin. Each and every one of us. Isn't that cheery? Well done, Paul. <laughs> Although, I've thought about this a lot. Um, so it does seem like I've prepared for this passage, but I, it's not this passage I've prepared for. Um, it, it's anytime I engage in Paul, with Paul or anytime I get in, into questions, uh, into discussions with people uh, who are trying to learn about, about uh, my faith, the Christian faith. Um, and, and, and there are two words that, 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 that pop up all the time that I really think uh, need to be examined as we use them. So the first one, the biggest one is sin, right? Um, sin just that, you know, it's the, it comes up a, a lot. Um, you know, we have already, we're already charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under the power of sin, and that makes sin seem like this thing that just lures us away from the good path. Um, you know, sin is is the devil. Sin is evil. In fact, we're under the power of sin. And then we have all these quotes from various Psalms. And like I said, I think Isaiah, Jared. No, it's Isaiah. Um, we have all these quotes, right, uh, that says um, no one seeks God. Uh, they've turned aside. They're worthless. Um their throats are open graves. Their tongues, they deceive. The venom of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Uh, their feet are swift to shed blood. Wow, that, oh, that's what sin is. Sin is cursing and bitterness. Don't swear. That's, that's, that's a sin. Don't lie. That's a sin. You know, um, it's easy to make that connection. Um, 
Fail to show kindness, that's a sin. Easy to make that connection. And frankly, I've grown up most of my life um, believing those very things, that that's what sin is. Um, sin is lying, cheating, stealing, um, uh, following the path of blood, uh, cursing, swearing, you know, don't take the Lord's name in vain. That's a sin. Um, all sorts of, of, of sins. And I'm not letting off my, myself off the hook and say, oh, no, no, those things are fine. That's, that's not right. But that is not sin. Those things may be sinful. But they in themselves are not sin. So for me, as a working definition, sin is separation from God. Sin is the distance between me and God. And so when I lie, cheat, steal, those things, yes, I, I, I feel myself move further away from God. So yes, those things are sinful. They're not sins in and of themselves the way that I think of it, but they do pull me away from God. By the way, so does arrogance. Um, so does laziness for me. Um, so does getting distracted. Um, all sorts of things. I, I miss opportunities and they're a sin. I don't think that there are crimes, that some of these, these sins, I don't think they're crimes against humanity. I don't think they make me a horrible person, but they separate me a little bit from God. When you hear about being born in original sin and a baby is born in sin, oh, how could a baby be born in sin? They haven't done anything. That's right. They haven't. They have not done anything. How can they be born in sin? Well, they inherit that, you know, from Adam, the original sin. Adam was in relationship with God in the garden, right? And again, I read this as a, as a, as a parable, um, not as history, but, but regardless, Adam is in the garden, with, with God, things are good. When Adam sins, Adam's out. Well, because that's what they, we're talking about here. Sin is that being distanced from God. So yes, we can say, well, that sin is when is when it was when Eve disobeyed God, and then and then Adam disobeyed God. Yeah, but the actual that that's the act that they committed that leads to the sin. The sin is the distance. They were sent out of the garden. Now, God followed them, but they were no longer as close to God as they had once been. Uh, I am born separated from God. Um, at three years old, I didn't know God. I didn't know my faith. I, I wasn't distant from God in that God, was, uh, God had turned away from me. You know, God was very present with me. But my growth hadn't happened yet. And so as I've grown spiritually, I grow closer to God. I, I, I make the sin less. And then I do a few things and I lose track and I make this in more back and forth. That to me is what we're talking about when we talk about sin. So, um, so if I was Paul writing to, to, to the church in Rome, it's like, yeah, you guys think that there's no sin for you because you're right up here with God because God gave you the law. You're the chosen people. But you're as distant from God as the Greeks, as anybody who is not actively trying to get closer to God, to not grow in faith. I mean, I, I think that everything is dynamic and always moving. I don't think anything stands still. So if I'm not actively trying to grow in faith, I suspect that I am moving away. I guess moving away would be this way. I'm moving away from faith, not toward it. So I, I think it's important to understand sin as a separation from God, at least when I read these passages, that makes a lot of sense to me. I am not um, in a unanimous group on this, by the way. Um, uh, faithful and rational minds may disagree with my reading uh, on the ultimate meaning of sin, but most of us are pretty close to some kind of agreement on that. So sin is this dis this distance, the separation from God. Um, and, and, and what scripture has done for the Jews that maybe the Greeks didn't get is they're aware that there's a separation. That's what the law gave them. Oh my gosh, I am not who I could be. I am not in the relationship that I might be. I'm not in a relationship that God wants me to be in. So you become aware of the distance. Because you're aware of the distance, you can work at it. So 
All of that works for me when I read this passage. The other one that comes up, which isn't nearly as big, but it's also uh, fear. Um, fear. Uh, that's one of the um, the quotes from from one of the one of the Psalms. Um, where did I find it? Um, yeah, verse eighteen here. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And you know, again, when I was a kid, and hear that, even as an adult, I hear that fear of God. So I should be hiding under the bed, afraid that God is going to find me. I should be not approaching God for fear that that God's going to hurt me. Um, what is that? Fear is a good word in that it, it describes an all-consuming um, experience. Uh, it, it is, um, uh, it's existential. Uh, it'll make you shake and quake. It's ecstatic. It, 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 fear, it, it, it's, it's a good word that way. But fear also suggests that we are afraid because the thing of which we are afraid is out to hurt us. And I find that that has put a lot, a lot of, of uh, a very negative association with God. God who is loving, God who is merciful, God who seeks us out, and God who is always with us. Um, but I'm afraid of God because God's going to punish me. So therefore, I'm going to hide my punishment. I'm going to hide my guilt from God. I'm going to hide my sin from God. I'm going to pretend we're right next to each other, even though there's a distance between us. I, I struggle with fear. I would prefer the word awe, oh, to be awestruck, to, to be aware, to have an inkling of God's greatness, of God's mercy, of God's love, of God's capacity for, for patience, to understand how much God wants well for me is awesome. And, and what I hear in that line from the psalm, um, quoted here by, by, by Paul, is that, uh, um, is that where, I'm sorry, I had to look at, for there it is, 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no awe in their eyes. They treat God as if God's ordinary, you know? like those pagan idols. Um, they treat God as if, well, you know, whatever, throw a little grain at the statue and maybe I'll have a good year this year in the fields. Um, I remember my wife saying to me during, uh, during Mass, um, my wife is Roman Catholic and we would attend Mass quite often, uh, and as the bell rings, a little bell rings, which is the moment of transubstantiation, a moment that uh, within the Roman Catholic tradition, within the Roman Catholic Mass, that that is that is the moment that 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 wafer becomes the body of Christ. Um, that is a, a faith statement. That is a, a belief. That is fundamental to to the Mass. That this this what was once a wafer, just a um, stuff uh, is now mystically truly the body of Christ and I remember my wife has the bell ring looking at me going why isn't everybody here crying she was wondering where's the awe where is the awe and I think a lot of us go through our faith without a whole lot of awe uh, and I think that that there are times that we need to be awestruck by God um, to realize who we're in this with uh, and, and, and have our breath taken away from time to time. Um, so for me, um, lack of awe separates me from God. So these words are true, but these words carry a lot of negativity that I don't think is necessary in the text. When I see sin as distance or separation from God, uh, and when I, when I translate fear as awe, so it's not that I don't have to be afraid of God. Uh, I'm in awe of a gorgeous sunset. I don't think the sunset's going to hurt me. Um, I need to be in awe of God, but even more so than I am of a sunset. It's much more, God's much more dynamic. Uh, and God 
loves me, which is different than the sunset. Um, but the fact that I could be loved by, by that which created the universe and fills and occupies the universe. How am I not awed by that? Anyway, these are the things that I think about as I go through this passage. But maybe, um, you know, it's more about, <laughs> maybe it's more about Paul just saying to, to, uh, to the Jewish Christians, hey, guys, pay attention. All these things that we've been saying for hundreds and hundreds of years, they're about us, not about the other. We're the ones whose mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Um, we, are, we, are, we are found wanting by God as well. Um, Anyway, I will leave that with you and see what comes of it in your hands, your imaginations. I will simply offer now a prayer. So let us pray. Loving God, humbly and imperfectly, we come into this moment. We come into this moment that we, we need to thank you for the opportunity to wonder, for the gift of wondering, the tools, the imagination that we might wonder about your words as revealed in Scripture. That we might wonder about that Scripture and how your words come alive in our world. We thank you for, for the ability to risk and the gift of perceiving that we might sense when we're starting to get it right. God, thank you for our wondering today. May we continue to wonder and may we be in awe of how much you love us all. We pray through the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's enough for today, but I look forward to checking in with you tomorrow as we keep going and see if we eventually convince, you know, these Greeks and these Jewish Christians to actually just get along. We'll see. Anyway, until I see you, God bless, which means, of course, that God sees you, that God loves you, and and that God's love moves through you into the world. I'll stop being you. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.